Are we ready to move on? Let's do it. All right. Let's talk about the Clone Wars review, Shadow of the Malevolence. Easy is the path to wisdom for those not blinded by ego. This is the second in a three-part arc about the new super weapon developed by the Separatist, Shadow of the Malevolence. It chronicles Anakin Skywalker's attempts to blast Grievous to oblivion and save the day with Shadow Squadron uh, before the bad guys can come and destroy a Republic medical installation. Making things harder than they should be, General Skywalker's stubborn attitude leads them into some unneeded trouble. Will that attitude lead them into a death trap? What did you like about this one, Luke Neitzel? They have good banter with the clones. I really appreciate D. Bradley Baker, who is the voice of the clones. It can't be an easy job to have to voice hundreds of characters that all have to have the exact same voice, but to still make them distinct and different. And he does a really good job in this one because the Shadow Squadron is Anakin's group of clone troopers who are going to fly bombers because they're going to go try and bomb the Malevolence and, and take it out. So they have to follow him through. And I think there's probably about 25 of them. And he does give them distinct flair and all these things while using the same voice. And I'm really impressed by that because that has to be really hard to pull off. And I think he's probably just going to give us more of that as time goes by, which is fun to see. Now, they they take this this flight and Anakin kind of bucks the rules, which I think is a good thing to show because that's what we've been led to believe about his fall is that he, he does things outside the lines and that's the quick and easy path, right? is what leads him to the dark side. So this was a good example of it. He, he doesn't go the right way. He takes shortcuts. He endangers them. He also almost loses. He does lose some of them on their bombing run, and he has to change his actual mission at the end because he wants to take out Grievous because he thinks that'll end the war. But if he does that, he's probably going to lose his whole squadron, and they might not even take out the Malevolence. So instead, he takes out the Ion Cannon, which basically saves most of the fleet. You see some growth from Anakin, but you also see some of that brashness that they talk about in the later movies. I enjoyed that. Um, I also enjoyed General Grievous in this one because he he murders his droids and they call him out on how he just doesn't care, which I think makes him a little bit scarier. It was funny, but scary. Like, I I enjoyed it, and it's kind of what a lot of people want to do to those droids is just knock their head off when they start talking. So, uh, yeah, I imagine you got a lot of pleasure out of that as well. Uh, Going back real quick to Anakin, uh, the movie shows us how angry and whiny is the movies that we saw in the past, but this shows us another aspect, and that seems important to the later Vader character. That's his arrogance. I like that we deal with that in this issue in a very direct way. His arrogance leads to the lives of those clone troopers that we spent two episodes previously worrying about directly leads to their deaths, and I thought that was really, really important. I also like the music in this episode. It's very hard to do John Williams without being John Williams. And we found that out in Rogue One. Although I've got some comments some other time about the music in Rogue One. And I thought uh, Ahsoka continues to get better and better. And she gets pants. Yeah, hey, hey, that's pants. right. She's still wearing a tube top and miniskirt, but she's but got pants, pants on underneath. under them. Yeah, that's so. right. Somebody okay. somebody got to George Lucas and One day Dave she'll Filoni. get a full outfit. Uh, the Nebula. I thought looked amazing. I don't know if it served much purpose, but there's like the orangey haze that the Shadow Squadron goes through and they encounter these like giant whale manta ray things and it just looks cool. Hated it. Yeah, I don't, it's not actually cool, but it looks cool. It didn't seem like Star Wars. It was, the manta rays looked dumb. I don't think they looked dumb. Oh, I thought they looked, I thought it was a very bad character design. They weren't threatening, even though they were supposed to be threatening. And one of them kind of bats Matchstick, who's one of the clone troopers, A-Wing, but they don't do anything. Those aren't A-Wings, Y-Wings. Y-wings. But that's all they really do. That's it not was... my problem with them. The the look is cool. I'm going to talk about them more in the bad oh, part. But I, like, see, I don't even think they the looked cool. And the idea, I thought, was bad, but I thought the look was cool. Last thing, space battle, really, really good. It gives you the tension that I want. seems to split the difference between the chaos that the show it seems to like, and the dramatic tension that I think is necessary to build excitement. Loved this space battle. Do you want to get to the bad, since we're, we're talking about uh, space whales? Well, yeah, because this is a bad episode. Alright, the space whales. It's beautiful, but nothing really happens, and there's a lot of talking that doesn't build any of the characters, doesn't build anything, it's just there and it feels like well, The whole point is so that An- Anakin made a bad decision, right? Right. Instead of going the route he should have gone, he tried to take a literal shortcut... 
and it took him through space whales that endangered pretty. some of the Y wings. They, they weren't even dumb. pretty. Were... But it just didn't feel like it fit, and, and it was bad. And I, I, the minute they did that, the whole episode just took a sour note for me, and I think I was unable to recover. Well, after so going slow space too. Whales. I mean, a lot of times in Star Wars, they can make a bad decision, but we just keep going to the action. So it's almost like I heard Billy Corgan talk about one time in like live shows when you hit a wrong note in a live show, who cares? Because you just keep going. Sure, and. I, that happens a lot in Star Wars, but this just kept dragging. The second, the um, the second act was just terrible, terribly slow. Yeah. Um. One thing going back to the first act, Anakin like predicts the entire plan right away from Grievous. Like they're gonna they're doing this, so they must be doing this and this and this. He only takes a handful of fighters on a mission that's super important to the Republic's survival. It's it, they they paint the malevolence as the main weapon of the entire thing, and they send twenty. 20 bombers. No, it was less than 20. Was it less than 20? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because each had gunners, so it was probably like 10. Right. And then Plo Koon just volunteers to go with. They didn't even assign him to go. So they have one starfighter and a bunch of bombers. They don't send their entire fleet or, you know, even a squadron. And the, the malevolence itself and Grievous on it, you know, last week they find out about the malevolence and Dooku wants to have Grievous killed, basically. And this week he doesn't care and he thinks he's <laughs> he's praising him like he's... You know, he's like, oh, I'm so glad you're in charge of this ship. Oh, well, what would we do without you as our leader? Which didn't fit what they just did. And then they destroy the Malevolence. And now it's we're three episodes in, and you kind of set up this major arc, and then you just solved it. <laughs> and we still have an episode. This it's is part two. two. We, have not, yeah. we have another episode about the Malevolence. I don't know. I mean, we'll see what happens with that one. But it's called, like, I don't know, Dawn of the Planet of the Malevolence. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. I don't really know the cost for exactly this right. <laughs> One other thing, like, Ahsoka is always mentioning, like, how they cannot lose any ships. She, like, mentions it, like, three times. We can't lose any ships. We can't lose any ships. And then, like, when they lost 6, 7, and 10, but she only says two of the names. So she <laughs> mentions, like, there's three of them, but then it's, like, Matchstick and Tag, I think. And there's, like, no third one. So, like, even Ahsoka doesn't care about the third yeah, clone. They didn't bother to learn all their names. Right. Just just a couple of them. This one's bad, right? Yeah, and there, there are some other things that that annoyed me is this is a minor thing and i don't even know why it bothers me but is at, at this time the tartakovsky clone wars mm -hmm. series is still canon my understanding is that it's not canon anymore but at the time it was and how that at that that show that ended in 2003 right before leading right up to revenge of the sith being released introduced grievous and you know, a lot of people talk about the, the Grievous coughing in Revenge of the Sith, but the reason he's coughing in Revenge of the Sith is because as they are fleeing the capital and he's and he's capturing Palpatine, Mace Windu, like, force crunches his chest and basically wounds him. But he's coughing in this episode, too, so they kind of threw that out, and that, that annoyed me, and I don't know why it annoys me. Probably no one else noticed it. But, you know, if you're going to make something canon and you're going to make it a major part of premiering a movie, then just stick to it. It's not that hard. And I don't think the coughing trade is anything anyone's particularly attached to that you need to, you just to work it in. to my extended universe legends thing that the Disney got rid of. So now it's nice that you feel just a little bit of pain that I feel for all those books that I read. Then. Yeah. Well, and the, the Tartakovsky show is fabulous. Yeah, it's if, great. if anyone out there hasn't seen the 2003 Clone Wars series... That is in the, it's in that kind of uh, I almost like stop motion paper animation style of Samurai Jack, which is what Tartakovsky did before that. But it's fantastic. I mean, the first season is maybe five or six minute episodes, and they're mm -hmm. just different battle scenes. And then it kind of ends with the introduction of General Grievous. And then the second season is just everything that happens in the opening scroll leading up to the start of Revenge of the Sith. Right. So that's fantastic. So to throw that out, kind of kind of pissed me off and whatnot and then to have this episode remind me that i'm kind of pissed off about that just didn't sit well with me and, and this was a boring one the other thing that's annoying me about the show in general at this stage between the movie and three episodes anakin and obi-wan have probably spent eight minutes in the same place together and you think of these two characters as these legendary swashbuckling buddies that are always together and they don't spend any time together they don't spend any time together in the prequels either i mean anakin or obi-wan spends phantom menace on the ship and then they split up really quickly after the opening sequence in attack of the clones to go you know obi-wan goes to kamino and uh anakin goes to naboo and then they meet up again on geonosis at the end 
And then in Revenge of the Sith, they're in the opening star battle and they immediately break up for the entire movie until they fight at the end. So at some point, just put the two of them doing stuff together rather than or, uh, Obi-Wan being the stern dad who just goes, oh, Anakin's doing it again. Oh my gosh. Ugh. Your future lies along a different path, apparently. Three out of three? Yeah, this is the worst one. Yeah, this I is, would agree. This is the worst one of the three by by far, and it it I just wish they would have they would have I I gotta stop saying it, but build build up the separatists, make them be strong. They even say lines in this one about how how General Grievous is always six steps ahead of them. No, he's not. He's getting <laughs> wiped across this galaxy and everything you've shown us so far. Like, start showing us the six steps ahead. That's what I want. All right, the final topic that we have tonight, other nerd stuff. What are you into lately? So this is going to be a really big soccer summer for me, and I know this is really what we're doing is we're using Star Wars to kind of talk about soccer because <laughs> we knew Star Wars would probably attract more people. It's a big soccer summer for me. I got season tickets to the Chicago Fire. I got season tickets to our local team here, which is a Division Four team called the Milwaukee Torrent, both their men's and women's team. And... The rumor on the street is that Dortmund is going to be playing in Chicago. And my my son loves Dortmund. He has a Dortmund jersey. All he wants for his birthday is Dortmund shorts and socks to match it. He loves Christian Pulisic. So if they come, I definitely got to take him to that. So I, I pulled out recently a, a couple new soccer books that I've, I've purchased that I really enjoy. And the one I'll talk about is Das Reboot, which is a story of the German soccer federation how they were failing and how they kind of restarted their program and it kind of intercuts between the history of their program and what they're doing to change it and then the next chapter will be about a certain game at the last world cup which they won so it's a really fun narrative especially if you you like german soccer and you're familiar with some of those players but it's also a thing where with where u.s soccer is right now i just want to mail copies to you know sunil galati and and all these other talking heads that are in charge of u.s soccer to be like please just read this and start doing some of this stuff because they really figured out a fantastic system and they got results right away and it's a fun read so it's called das reboot das reboot for me, uh, Frank Miller's Daredevil, if you are a fan of Batman, much of what we think of of Batman now comes the, the major shift. You could argue Denny O'Neill for me. I think it really hit home with Frank Miller. But Frank Miller did Daredevil before he did Batman and did a lot of the things uh, that he's known for for Batman in Daredevil and set that sor- sort of atmosphere up. He's the creator of Elektra. Uh, one of my favorite characters got really did really interesting work with Bullseye, and that's a great read if you get the chance if you can read his run on Daredevil. So for which is a good tune-up because we got to be getting narrowing in on a, another season soon too. Season three, I don't know who's in it. I'm really hoping that Bullseye is in it. That would be my dream right now. Um, but I guess we'll have well, to they, see. They just cast Joanne Wally or Whaley, Val Kilmer's ex-wife, who was in Willow. As Daredevil's mom, I just saw that. That's a spoiler. Come across, you just you whatever. just spoiled so, it. Spoiler alert! Didn't didn't everyone know that was his mom? I think no, they tell you he's sister going to Maggie. Mom. No, that's uh, that's no. not. Yeah, that's, it's his mom. That's a, that's a spoiler. It's eh, a spoiler. That's fine. She nurses him to. I'll throw it in the comments. We better go. You better go. <laughs> we better go right now before we get in trouble. Tell me uh, I suck. Uh, this has been uh, Maya Madrid and also Luke Neitzel. Luke, where can they find you on Twitter? I am at Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L. And for me, at Maya Madrid, it's been fun. Uh, Please don't hurt Luke too bad about that spoiler. We'll see you later. Bye. Thank you for listening to Kids Seriously. This episode was recorded and produced at Camro Studios. Visit our website at www.kidsseriously.wordpress.com or email us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Kids Seriously. Until next time.